everybody, welcome back to another episode of Gideon Stuff Adventures. I am filming from the garage and it's nighttime. We'll see how the lighting is. Probably not great, but I'll try to brighten it up a little bit during editing. So in today's video, we're traveling to the Gila Lower Box Canyon. This is located um, in the southwestern part of New Mexico, pretty close to the Arizona border. Closest town is going to be Verdon or Red Rock, depending on which side you want to come at it from. And this is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous riparian area. The Gila River flows through the Chihuahuan Desert. And as you drop down into the bottom of this canyon, the flora and fauna changes drastically. You go from the high Chihuahuan Desert scrublands into a green, lush river valley. And it's something truly, truly spectacular. And I can't wait to show it to you guys. In addition, we are gonna be jumping the border into Arizona to look for some agates. And we're gonna talk a little bit about agate formation, finding agates, rock hounding, things like that. It's gonna be a blast. Now, as you watch this video, I want you to keep a word, or technically a term, in your mind. And that term is regional geology. Geology has a lot of different forms. You can zoom into the microscopic level and do mineralogy and petrology and look at how crystals uh, line themselves, how minerals grow, how rocks change and evolve. Or you can zoom out and go big picture with tectonics. How is the planet changing? How are the continents moving around? Things like that. Regional geology is kind of that big picture zoomed out type of geology. It tells the story of an area and it tells how that area, how that landscape has changed over the course of millions or even billions of years. And this is the kind of geology that I really love. The geology that tells a story. Now, before we get into the details of the Gila Lower Box Canyon area and the kind of Duncan um, area in general, they're about the same thing, I want to talk a little bit about the regional geology of New Mexico as a whole. We can split New Mexico into eight geologic provinces. These are um, different areas that are characterized by unique suites of rocks or by unique tectonic um, events. And these eight uh, different areas are the Colorado Plateau, the Valles Caldera, the Southern Rocky Mountains, the Great Plains, the Permian Basin, the Rio Grande Rift, the Basin and Range, and the Mogollon Dato uh, Volcanic Field. The Gila Lower Box Canyon is part of the Mogollon Dato Volcanic Field. And those are not my um, provinces that I came up with for New Mexico. I actually got those out of this amazing book here. This is part of a two-part um, collection, um, the Geology of Southern New Mexico's Peaks, Monuments, and Public Lands. The other one is the Geology of Northern New Mexico's Peaks, mo Parks, Monuments, and Public Lands, not Peaks. My bad. Um, I highly recommend these books. They're published by the New Mexico Bureau of uh, Geology and Mineral Resources. They're just fantastic books. If you live in New Mexico and you're interested in geology and you're interested in the outdoors and the landscapes of the area, these are a must. And even if you're not from New Mexico, but you're interested in the geology of the Southwest, these are great. And if you kind of want more info on any of my adventures, I highly recommend picking up these books. You can kind of read um, a little bit more. Uh, not all of my adventures are covered uh, by, by these books, but most of the ones that are kind of well known to the public are. So I cite from these quite a bit. Um, I have them linked down in the description of this video along with all my other sources that I'll be using um, throughout. The Mogollon Dato Volcanic Field covers an area of about 15,000 square miles in southwestern New Mexico and extending into eastern Arizona. The terrain is rugged and varied, containing everything from high mountain alpine biomes to desert scrubland. Lots of rivers and some of New Mexico's most prominent mountains dominate this area. In this area, you can find Precambrian igneous and metamorphic rocks, as well as Paleozoic and Mesozoic sedimentary rocks. But the most dominant lithologies are Cenozoic, volcanic and volcanic classic rocks erupted and deposited between 40 million and 25 million years ago. Of particular note are the numerous calderas in the area, many of them rivaling the Valles Caldera of northern New Mexico or even Yellowstone of Wyoming in size. These calderas over the course of many millions of years erupted a series of different volcanic rocks. 
Everything from basalts and andesites to rhyolites. Hey, look, I upgraded my lights. This looks a lot better. I might have to reshoot the first part of this. You know what? No, it's, it's too late for reshoots. It, it's late at night. Gideon does not feel like doing reshoots, so there will be no reshoots. Just appreciate what we have now. Um, anyways, I promise I am going to get you guys the actual adventure here pretty soon, but before we do that, I want to set some context. And that's the most important thing when we're talking about regional geology, is context. We want to be looking at all these different uh, rock units, lithologies, in context, right? We've got a lot going on here. There are several different rock units exposed out here. And we want to kind of understand them all in relation to each other so we can better tell the story of this area. And so we're going to be talking about these rocks from youngest to oldest. And to do that, I want to tell you guys a little bit about the law of superposition. This is a very, very important principle of geology. And it's very simple. Younger rocks are deposited on top of older rocks. This kind of goes hand in hand with the law of original horizontality, which states that all rock units are deposited horizontally, originally. Kind of in the name, right? And this makes sense. If you're having a river wash sediments over a surface and deposit those sediments, they're going to be horizontal, right? Gravity's just going to do that. Um, if you have a volcano that erupts and spews forth a big cloud of ash, that ash is going to settle horizontally, right? Um, and then all these units, of course, are going to stack one on top of another. You can have a river put down some siltstone, and then you can have a volcano erupt some ash over the top of it, and you're just going to stack units like that or stack different lithologies. And the oldest stuff is going to be at the bottom and the youngest stuff is going to be at the top. This is why geologists love canyons. Canyons are awesome because they cut down through the rock layers and let us see everything that's exposed from the surface through the subsurface. Not everything all the time. We can't have grand canyons everywhere, but it lets us look underneath the surface. Gives us a little bit of a, of a x-ray vision, if you will. And we don't even have to do anything. I mean, we can do that anywhere. You drill a hole, you pull out a rock core, and you can see what's down there. But that's a lot of work. It's nice to just have it done for us by nature. So the youngest rocks we're going to be seeing out here, not counting modern quaternary alluvium and gravels and things like that, is going to be the Gila conglomerate. And this is a very prolific unit throughout a lot of uh, southwestern New Mexico. Um, this rock unit is about 21 million years old. It's a sedimentary rock. It's a conglomerate, who would have thought? Um, and it is basically made up of sediments that have been um, brought down from the higher mountains by stream. If you've ever been to the Gila cliff dwellings, um, they are actually built into caves formed within the Gila conglomerate. Now the next rock unit worth talking about is the 28 million year old Bloodgood Canyon Tuff. Tuff is a type of extrusive igneous rock or a volcanic rock and it's rhyolitic in composition and it's basically ash flow, right? So this is going to be very, very fine particles of minerals and ash um, that collect after a volcanic eruption. And the Bloodgood Tuff was erupted from a caldera called the Bursum Caldera, which is one of the more important and famous uh, calderas in the Mogollon Dado Volcano, Volcanic Field. We're not doing reshoots, did I mention that? And uh, if I ever make a video, which I really, really want to, on the Glenwood Catwalks Recreation Area, we'll talk a lot about the, the Bursum Caldera then. Um, I love the catwalks, by the way. I've been there several, several times. They're amazing. They're wonderful. If you're ever in um, the Glenwood, New Mexico area, definitely check them out. They're, it's three bucks to get in there, and it's phenomenal. You, you will not regret it. It's amazing. The next tuff that we're going to talk about is the Caballo Blanco tuff. And this one's about 38, no, 32 million years old. And this one, uh, we actually, I know for a fact that we saw when I was out there at the uh, at the Lower Box Canyon. I think I saw Blood Good Tuff, but I'm not sure exactly where it was. I know where I saw um, the uh, Caballo Blanco Tuff. And so uh, I'll put it, I'll label it when we come across it in the videos. But again, another tuff, another ash fall, basically. One of my lights died. Anyways, the last tuff that we're going to talk about is the Box Canyon Tuff, which is about 33 million years old. 
And between all of these different tufts, and above and below them as well, we have a couple of andesite units. Now, one of the best maps I found of this area, and this is where I'm getting a lot of my sources from, I'll link it in the description of course, um, is a map that was made back in 1965. I'm not sure if there's been a recategorization of some of these units in the years since, but these andesites are generally just called the upper and lower andesite. And that lower andesite is gonna become very important um, later on when we go to Round Mountain. So just kind of keep it in the back of your mind. Andesite is a more um, intermediate uh, volcanic um, composition. It's uh, right after basalt. Um, if basalt is a, a mafic um, composition and rhyolite is a felsic composition, andesite is what comes after basalt. And there's those two units. And then there's also a bunch of volcanic clastic sandstones between the tufts. And this is really, really common. You'll see this all the time with a lot of tufts. Um, another very common tuff unit in New Mexico is the Belltop Tuff, also called the Kneeling Nun Tufts. And these are numbered seven through two. Don't ask where number one went. It never existed. It's a long story. We're not going to get into it here. But between each of these actual tufts, which is the ash fall themselves, you have these little volcanic clastic sandstones. And what a volcanic clastic sandstone is, is just sandstone made from eroding those tufts. So those tufts get deposited, they cool, they solidify, and then streams erode them and deposit this sandstone that's made of little tiny clasts from these rhyolite tufts. And so this sandstone is very, very rich in quartz and plagioclase and biotite and things like that that you pick up from that uh, tuff. And that's why we call it volcanic clastic. Volcana from the volcanic rocks and then clastic because it's a clastic sedimentary rock. Pretty big brain move right there. And the last thing we're gonna mention before we go to the adventure footage is Canador Peak, um, which is where I, I park my vehicle, my truck near Canador Peak. It's made out of 35 million year old um, igneous rocks, mostly latite. And these belong to um, what's called the Dado Formation. Quick interjection. Yes, my map from 1965 is a little bit outdated. Um, we have had some revisions. So what I called the Dado Formation has now been upgraded to the status of a group. So a group contains a lot of various formations. And so basically, back in ye olden days, geologists in the area just took basically all of, vol all of the volcanic units in the area and labeled them the Dado Formation. And then in subsequent years, when dating techniques got better, we were able to kind of separate them from each other. And uh, I was talking about like the um, Caballo Blanco Tuff and the Box Canyon Tuff. Those are parts of what used to be the Dado Formation. So keep that in mind. The um, stratigraphy out there has been divided up considerably more than the maps that I was looking at uh, convey. So a little bit of a correction. So there we go. We've set some context basically throughout the period of about 10 or so million years that we've discussed here. We've had volcanic eruptions of various compositions. Then we've had erosion of those eruptions, deposition of some sedimentary rocks, another eruption on top, erosion, eruption, et cetera, et cetera. Kind of the process that everything is going through um, in geology, especially in a um, volcanic dominated system. Now, as I walk along the river and stuff, I will put up um, labels on the screen of each rock unit that we're walking through to the best of my recollection. Again, when you're out in the field and stuff, and, to, and I did not have a geologic map with me when I was out um, in this area. Again, the only map I can really find of this area that was very accessible and detailed was this map from 1965. I did not have it with me when I was out there that day. So I might say some things that are incorrect as I'm walking there, but I'll try my best to correct myself when that is the case. And um, I'll put up labels for everything that I um, am unsure about. So you should still be able to get plenty of good information. Let's go ahead and roll the footage.
This is kind of cool because all the cliffs look like they're made out of tough. And like all the stuff we walked through on the top was all this basalt and andesite. And so what's still on top here is float mostly, but right there we transition into what's mostly going to be rhyolites and tufts. Red to white. Just like those cliffs. Oh, this is so cool. Is there water down there? Sounds like it. Can you hear all the animals? I don't see that. I don't want to run into a fucking mountain lion. <laughs> it sounds like a bunch of birds and I think I heard a deer. Some big old mud cracks. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out. Okay. I think my hands need water. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Little fish jumped at me. And some noisy frogs. No, I mean, I doubt it. Maybe. Oh yeah, those cliffs look good. <laughs> These tough cliffs are incredible. I'm not sure what tough this is. There's quite a few in the area. This might be the Bloodgood Tough. And I think I forgot the names of the rest. It looks like right there's a different one. And then up top, it looks like we've got Andesites. Maybe Bear Wallow. Maybe not. So it looks like a little bit of a storm might be rolling in. So we are going to probably head to high ground and go back that way. This would be a great place to camp. <laughs> Unless it does a little bloody do.
And just like that, <coughs> we're out of the riparian, lush oasis, and back to the desert. <coughs> I'm choking on a bug. Found a little bit of tumbled agate. I think so. <laughs> we kind of took you to your limit today, didn't we? We kind of took you to your limit today. Yeah, just jump off. Just end it now. Adventure over. That's pretty stable. Janelle spotted some wooden boards on that little cliff under that overhang there. So I'm gonna run down and see what it is. I don't think it's a Native American dwelling. I think it's probably a more modern thing just cause the way the boards look. The reality is not very cool. Looks like they're just fence posts. Mm. Oh, but there is an arch here. Oh, that's pretty cool. We are going to go through this little gap here and then up. Jump. You can go around if you want. Isn't this crazy? It's awesome. Bunch of lithics. You know, I think that's water. It does seem like this would be a great spot for cliff dwellings because of the proximity to the river. But maybe these cliffs were already tumbled down like this. 700, 1,000 years ago. And yes, by the way, there is actually extensive evidence that indigenous peoples did, in fact, use and exploit this area's natural resources over the course of many thousands of years. Not super surprising, but since we had that little back and forth, I figured I would throw this in there. There's definitely artifacts that have been found in this area and several dwellings. Cougar. Huh? It's pretty old. Do you see all the hair in it? Yeah. That's how you tell it's predator. And then the shape is what told me it was a cat. And it's not here no more, right? Not here no more. Hey, and there's the fence. Yeah, we've got no well, probably just a probably a conformable contact. We've got like a older andesite overlain by a uh, younger tuff, which kind of makes sense because in a bimodal volcanic system like the Mogollon volcanic field is, you erupt your mafix first and then your felsic stuff.
Alrighty, let's go ahead and hop on over to Round Mountain, Arizona for fire agates. Now, all the lithologies that we just went over are going to be the same. They're going to apply here to Round Mountain as well. We are in the same region. The map that I'm using for this video covers both the Gila Lower Box Canyon and Round Mountain. It's called the Canador Duncan Quadrangle Map, obviously named for Canador Peak and the town of Duncan in Arizona. Um, so yeah, same rocks. We don't really have to introduce anything new, but we really only want to focus on one rock unit, and that is the upper andesite. Remember I told you to remember that one? Here's why. As far as I can tell, this is the unit that the fire agates are occurring in. Um, again, I'm going off of an old map, but from what I could see while I was out there, it's definitely an andesite. And um, just going off this old map, I'm pretty sure it's our younger andesite unit. So, ta-da! I totally remember it, and it became important again. Look at that. Well, Janelle decided to show me one of her favorite agate spots. This is Round Mountain, Arizona, and holy cow, I'm glad we came here because this place is incredible. Look at that fire agate. This is the best fire agate I've ever found <laughs> uh, by far. I've even got some pieces in there that are really good. Pro tip, find prairie dog holes. They dig the stuff up so that you don't have to. And I'm, I'm barely even away from the truck. <laughs> I found so much good stuff. This is, this is ridiculous. I think this is my favorite one that I've found so far. There's Round Mountain. I might run up to the top and see if I can find any geodes. So what the heck even is agate? Well, it's an accumulation of cryptocrystalline or microcrystalline quartz, also called chalcedony, and uh, Another mineral that's identical in chemical composition to quartz, but has a different, uh, it crystallizes in a different crystal system called moganite. Um, basically, agate is just cryptocrystalline silica, right? Quartz is silicon dioxide, SiO2, and that's what agate is. Chemically, it's, it's just quartz. Um, now, interestingly, we don't actually know how agates form. We've got some ideas and we know the ingredients, but uh, the physics behind how agates form is, is kind of interesting. But basically, agates form from silica-rich water that is intruded into open spaces within rocks and precipitates um, this quartz behind. And it grows into geodes, right? Um, you can find agates in any kind of rock, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic, uh, but they're commonly associated with Igneous rocks, just because igneous rocks tend to have a lot of open holes and vesicles. Look at that. Now, a lot of the stuff that we even find today, I kind of classify more as chalcedony, uh, just because some of it's not as banded um, as you sometimes expect from agate. But um, gorgeous stuff. A lot of fire agates uh, in this area. So right now, I'm headed up. I don't know where Janelle went. I think she's over that way somewhere. Should probably be following her because she already she already found the best piece of the day. She always finds the best stuff. 
she is one hell of an agate hunter. And actually, I can't let her know I said this, but she's probably a better rock hound than I am. I tend to get very excited about even little things, and so I get distracted very, very easily. But she, uh, she stays focused, and she's got a, a higher standard than me. If something is not up to her code of quality, she discards it and move on. I like to take a lot of stuff, so yeah. But anyways, I'm heading up the mountain because... All the agate that we're looking at here, even though it's just kind of loosely scattered on the ground, it's eroding out of um, these rocks in the area. Like right now we're looking at a bunch of intermediate volcanic rocks. You can see here, very vesicular. Um, and so I'm hoping that if I get closer to the top of the mountain, I might find some rocks that still have uh, the agate in them that I can crack open like geodes and... Uh, Hopefully get some cool stuff because obviously the further you wait the further away you come from the source um, the more eroded things get sometimes this doesn't work out with agates but uh, I'm taking my shot today I know some of us do just pick up greatness are you going to show me something else to, to ruin my day yes oh gosh let's see what you picked up this time This one was on the way up here. Kind of mid. This is like as good as the best piece I found. <laughs> that one, multiply variation, happier with that one. Yeah, that one. Oh, wow. That one's got like that reflectiveness. That's cool. That's my big one. The fire on that is crazy. Yeah, that one does have a good reflection. Well, I have not found greatness up to your standards yet. I'm hoping to find a geode up here. We'll see. A jode. A jode. I don't know if they'd stand up to the Janelle code, but I think they're pretty cool. Oh, that's nice. Look at this. <laughs> oh, a geode for me. There we go. We found a geode. All right, let's go ahead and talk about how agates form. Conceptually, it's not that complicated. We understand what forms agates. The how is a little more complicated, but let's go ahead and get into the what. Agates are an example of secondary mineralization. There's two types of mineralization, primary and secondary. Primary, primary mineralization, No retakes. Science words are hard sometimes. They're, they're, they're tongue twisters. And especially for me, I'm someone who constantly confuses my words and I lisp and mix things up. Sometimes I, I trip over my own words. Let's, um, let's try this again. <laughs> Primary minerals are the minerals that are essential to constructing a rock. They have to form for you to have a rock. The best way to think about this is think about a magma body. As this magma cools, minerals start to form. Magma is hot, it's full of a bunch of elements, and while these elements are sitting in this big hot soup, their atoms are vibrating violently and they can't form bonds. But as this magma cools, we're losing energy, we're coming to a lower energy state, these atoms start to vibrate slower and they can form bonds. As these atoms form bonds, they start to build um, compounds, and these compounds arrange themselves into crystal lattices, and pretty soon you start growing crystals. And those are primary crystals. Those crystals, let's, again, we're sticking with our, our magma body. Let's say that we start forming some feldspars and some quartzes. Quartzes isn't a thing. We're forming feldspars and quartz and micas, and they're coming together to form a nice big chunk of granite. Secondary minerals are minerals that are deposited or formed in that rock after it has already formed. So this can be minerals that grow inside 
spaces, voids, vesicles, cracks in a rock, and that's what the case is with agate. Now this agate is forming in an andesite. When this andesite was erupted, it was full of gas. These gases escaped as the rock cooled, leaving behind vesicles or holes in the rock. Later, as the rock was eroded and exposed to the elements, it started to break down. It started to open up into cracks and split apart and more little holes got eroded into it. And so basically we're left with a Swiss cheese rock. And at some point, a supersaturated silica water flowed through this rock. Now, silica is one of the most common elements um, on Earth, and so it's also water soluble. It gets dissolved into water. As this water seeps into these rocks, it leaves that silica behind. And this is um, silicon dioxide, SiO2, quartz, essentially. And this stuff kind of collects inside these holes in the rock and it grows geodes, agates. And that is the simple explanation. Now the actual formation of agates is a little more complicated. And by a little more, I mean way, way more complicated. For one thing, if you think about a hole in a rock, we've got an up and a down, right? Agates grow evenly from the outsides in. How? You would think with gravity that everything from this super saturated liquid that gets into this rock would sink to the bottom and then kind of grow like that. But no, it appears that agates will grow from the sides in. And there's different mechanisms proposed to explain this. I'm not gonna go into those right here. The other thing is that agates are not 100% quartz. A lot of cases they're 100% silicon dioxide, silicon dioxide, but there's two different minerals, quartz and moganite. And moganite has the same chemical composition as quartz, SiO2, but it has a different crystalline structure. And so you'll have like 90% quartz, 10% moganite um, in a, an agate. And it seems like the moganite will form right after the priming layer and then will grow quartz for the rest of it. It's very, very complicated. We're not going to go into all of it here. I will link a couple of papers by a mineralogist called Peter Heenley um, in the description. He's done a lot of research on this and he can explain it far, far better than me. Bottom of the story though is that it's very, very complicated. All right, so let's go ahead and clean up some of these agates. It's a few days later. Um, let's take a look at what we've got. A lot of these are gonna be covered in moss and lichen, algae and dirt, all kinds of stuff like that. So I've got a few here that have been soaking for a couple of days. Um, <laughs> I've got some more in a Gatorade bottle that I was using to pick them up. Uh, these have been soaking for quite a while. Uh, and then I got a bunch of big ones out in my truck that I haven't got yet. But let's go ahead and see what is under this. Grab one of my little picky tools. Get some of that stuff out of some of these cracks and crevices. Look at this guy. Yeah, that's a pretty one. Needs a little more cleaning, but yeah, I like that. I like that quite a bit. I think I think we're gonna have some good ones in here. This one is actually really nice. Yeah, look at that. Sweet. Okay, so I'm far from done with cleaning all these up, but let's uh, let's go ahead and look at some of these because um, I came out with some pieces that I think are pretty fantastic. So number one, 
This is a kind of interesting little piece. I love the bubbly texture. This is um, also a geode on the inside, and this is kind of more of the stuff that I consider chalcedony um, because we don't have much banding, although I guess this one does have a little bit. Um, let's look at this right here, though. This is really cool. I love this little piece here. Just two little bubbles. So cool. If we flip it over, there's that texture. Some people call these chalcedony roses. Uh, pretty cool there. Um, I've actually got some other pretty cool pieces in this little bag right now. Here's a good piece of fire agate. Obviously, we're not going to go over all of these. I want to show this one. This is actually one of my favorites. This one cleaned up so nice, but I love the bubbly texture. I love that eye right there. I mean, look at this. Look at that waviness. This was all covered in uh, algae, and then I cleaned it off, and I was just stunned at how good it is. This one is pretty fun. You can see here we've got some banding. Got some of those agate textures. Uh, this one's another just bubbly, bubbly one. This piece also has some, some banding. Kind of neat. Um, this is a good piece. Look at that. Love that. And <laughs> I actually ended up coming away with a bunch of really, really good pieces. More good pieces than I was expecting. This one here. Great texture on this one too. I mean, it's so smooth and round. Wish you guys could could feel these. They're they're pretty they're pretty freaking cool. There's a good whoops, good bit of fire. That one's cool. Oh, this one, this one's awesome. <laughs> Looks like a little little mushroom, and then he's he's open on the bottom. So that's sweet. And of course, here's more bits and bobs over here. I really like this little piece. It's very, very cool. There's another one I put over here that I really liked. Where'd it go? This one right here. Look at that. Very, very nice. Um, <laughs> oh gosh, there's so many good ones. What do I want to look at next? <laughs> there's that. Um, over here, we got some really, really nice ones. We're kind of in the shade right here. Pretty dark. I like that. Got all kinds of cool tiny ones right here. Some good texture, good patterns on that. Um, over here, some bigger stuff. This is actually an agate from a different place, but I found it in the back of my truck, so I cleaned it up today. See that banding down there? That's pretty cool. And then we got some of these big pieces. This one might be my favorite. And this one I kind of want to break open, but I probably won't. I wish I had a rock saw. <laughs> I really wish I had a rock saw. All right, so I just cleaned this one up, this piece of silica that I found, and it's not all that pretty. It's not great. There's some nice textures over here, but uh, kind of a dud. Enter hammer. Let's bust this open and uh, see if it's a little more interesting on the inside. If it even breaks.
Nope, not really. This one had too long to grow. It's pretty much just homogenous through the whole thing. So, eh, well, they can't all be winners. So what is an agate? Agates are basically these banded formations of quartz. Also sometimes called chalcedony. Um, you fucker. <laughs> Maybe it'll be easier if I just show you some. Alrighty, so right here we can see a piece of round mountain fire agate under the microscope. And you can clearly make out these alternating bands. And that's really what makes agate agate, is these alternating bands. Now these bands, as we already discussed, are made of quartz. Um, specifically a type of quartz called chalcedony, which is cryptocrystalline quartz. Cryptocrystalline quartz um, means that the quartz is not growing in its um, preferred crystal habit. It's not showing the shapes that are indicative of quartz. So for example, if we compare it to this rock right here, you can see that this shows quartz growing in a bunch of little spires. And actually this might even be easier to see with the uh, magnifying glass as well. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, see that? Those are called dipyramids. And that is how quartz wants to form. When it does not form like that, when it forms kind of amorphously, we call it cryptocrystalline. And then when you have alternating layers of this cryptocrystalline chalcedony, we call that agate. And it's, it's very, very gorgeous. Now the colors in agate uh, come from impurities within the quartz. Elemental um, inclusions can change the color. It changes the way that the, the mineral reflects light, it changes the light that passes through the mineral. And uh, typically reds are indicative of high iron content. Uh, iron can also cause purple, things like that. Um, I want to look at this little agate right here. This is not from Round Mountain. This is um, a different location. Let's see here. Try to find the best angle for this. Sit up, you. Yeah, there we go. Try not to get in my light. Now we can see here that we actually have, this is a little geode, we have these alternating bands, just like we saw in that other piece, but then we also have the quartz growing in its crystalline shape here in the center where it's open. So this is one of the complications with agate, is we form a lot of fibrous and um, cryptocrystalline silica layers through here, and then we can grow like fully formed quartz. If we look down here, the first layer that gets deposited is called the priming layer, and you may not be able to see right here, but it's typically a dark green color. The color can change with exposure to the elements and um, inclusions by other materials. This one here does have a little bit of a green tinge uh, to it though. But yeah, so right through here, we've got alternating layers of cryptocrystalline quartz, as well as that moganite that we were talking about. And uh, it's very, very beautiful. Definitely, uh, you can see why collectors and rock hounds enjoy agates so, so much. Well, guys, I think I'm going to call it quits there. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully it wasn't too long. I won't know how long it is until I start to edit it and decide what I'm cutting out, what I'm keeping in. But I didn't bring out the whiteboard today, so, you know, there we go. Hopefully we save some time there. But, again, I hope you enjoy this video, and I hope you're looking forward to the next Getting In Stuff Adventures video because we've got some bangers coming up. We've got some really great adventures. I'm actually filming this part of the video about a month after I actually went to... Uh, the lower box canyon and stuff, and I've had several adventures in between there, and I've got several adventures planned for the future that are gonna be pretty sweet, so keep an eye out for those. Um, 
Anything else? I don't really think so. Big shout out to my channel members right here at the Cowboy level. I really appreciate everything they do. If you want to become a channel member, there's a button down below. As for the rest of you, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, leave it a like, comment below, and subscribe. I've been Gideon, and I'll see you in the next one. Adios. <laughs>